bugs in OS X, iOS, SAP, SonicWall, and outside in technology draw warnings and fixes. Holy Crypt is the latest bit of ransomware. A free decryptor is now available for BART. Turkey's crackdown on dissidents in the wake of the weekend's failed coup involves not only purges, but close attention to what's being said online. ISIS tunes its inspiration and works through some jamming. And there's now a fatwa against Pokemon Go. Hackers are expected to turn to the U.S. presidential campaigns, and neither Cozy Bear nor Fancy Bear are likely to be invited to the party. Time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, NetSparker. Still scanning with labor-intensive tools that generate more false positives than real alerts? Let NetSparker show you how you can save time and money and improve security with their automated solution. How many sites do you visit and therefore scan that are password protected? With most other security products, you've got to record a login macro, but not with NetSparker. Just specify the username, the password, and the URL of the login page, and the scanner will figure out everything else. Visit NetSparker.com to learn more. And if you'd like to try it for yourself, you can do that too. Go to NetSparker.com slash CyberWire for a free 30-day fully functional trial version of NetSparker Desktop. Scan your websites and let NetSparker show you how easy they make it. That's netsparker.com slash cyberwire. And we thank NetSparker for sponsoring our show. I'm Dave Bittner in Baltimore with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, July 21st, 2016. Consensus among experts at midweek is that several patches and hot fixes are indeed important and should be applied as soon as reasonably possible. The first set of these affect Apple's OS X and iOS systems. Because they involve exploitable vulnerabilities and image handling capabilities, they're being compared to last year's Android stage fright issue. The TIFF image processing bug is thought particularly easy to exploit. Many programs, notably messaging apps, email clients, and browsers, render images without using interaction. If left unpatched, vulnerable devices are susceptible to a buffer overflow condition. Once weaponized, the bugs could permit remote code execution. So the consensus is patch. Now that Apple has a fix for the responsibly disclosed issues, Cisco's Talos unit has released some detailed information on their vulnerability research, which you can find on their website. Oracle fixed 276 issues with its software on Tuesday. 17 of the high-risk vulnerabilities patched also affect software developed by third parties. Vulnerability researchers at Cisco's Talos unit, again, were the ones who found and disclosed them. The Oracle Outside In Technology, OIT, a collection of software development kits, is the locus of the vulnerabilities. Since OIT is licensed to other companies for use in their own products, the likelihood is high that widely used software is affected. Oracle hasn't said which third-party products are affected, but CSO Magazine notes that Microsoft Exchange, Novell Groupwise, IBM WebSphere Portal, Google Search Appliance, Avira Antivir for Exchange, Raytheon SureView, Guidance Encase, and Veritas Enterprise Vault are known to use Oracle's outside-in technology. Dell has issued a hotfix for its Sonic Wall software, closing, among six issues, a backdoor disclosed by Digital Defense. That backdoor involved a hidden default account in Dell's Sonic Wall global management system, weakly protected with a weak password. Sonic global management system is used for enterprise central monitoring and management of network security devices. And Onapsis details security issues it's found with the widely used business software SAP HANA and SAP TREX. The flaws would permit various forms of privilege escalation within affected systems. AVG finds a new strain of ransomware. They're calling it Holy Crypt, and the version they found seems to be a developmental one. Holy Crypt is written in Python and compiled into a Windows executable. It's expected that Holy Crypt will use the customary Tor payment channels, but the story is still, as they say, developing. If you're curious about Tor, by the way, we'll learn more about it from the University of Maryland's Jonathan Katz later in this podcast. He'll discuss Tor's limitations and some emerging alternatives. AVG also has some good news. They've developed and are offering for free a decryptor for the recently discovered BART ransomware. So bravo, AVG. ISIS sites may have come under hacktivist denial-of-service attack earlier this week. Some familiar tools, including NetStressor, are said to have been used in the incidents. 
As observers sift through the ISIS HR documents recently compromised and dumped on the Internet, they conclude that ISIS recruiting themes seem to be tailored closely to local concerns. What plays in Tunis may not succeed in Anatolia. ISIS online operations continue to focus on inspiration, and their rivals in Al-Qaeda seem to be following a similar pattern. Howling to the lone wolves is likely to remain the jihadist template for information operations for the foreseeable future. Authorities in Germany see an absence of direct command and control in the recent train attacks, and discounting the role of inspiration downplay the ISIS role. But inspiration, not direction, is what recent history should lead one to expect. Turkey's President Erdogan continues his crackdown in the wake of the failed coup attempt against him. Widespread purges continue, with senior military officials and judges regarded as likely sympathizers within the coup being the most prominent individuals purged. In sheer numbers, however, teachers seem most affected, as thousands have lost their certifications and have been removed from the classroom. The number of people purged is said to be approaching 50,000. The government is also watching social media closely. Individuals who have tweeted either hostility toward the government or disrespect toward President Erdogan have been arrested. Other attempts at narrative control are underway. Turkey's government continues to seek to block WikiLeaks, but the more than 300,000 emails that have been dumped remain widely available. Hacktivist Phineas Fisher claims to be the one who hacked the ruling AKP party. Pokemon Go continues to give security teams, players, and advertisers fits. Its wild popularity continues to choke the bandwidth its proprietors have been able to give it, but they're working hard to scale up. It's also unwelcome in Saudi Arabia, where religious scholars have revived their earlier fatwa against Pokemon. It's objectionable not as one might have supposed for any Shinto background, but rather because of the Darwinian undertones the scholars perceive in the way the Pokemon evolve. This suggests to some observers not so much simply killjoy disapproval of Pikachu and the others, but some haziness about what Darwinian theory actually says about evolution. It's a political year in the U.S. and a political season of that year, so hackers are turning their attention to the presidential campaigns. This week, their ministrations were directed largely to the Republicans. The Democrats will take center stage in cyberspace when their own convention opens. Avast set up a bogus Wi-Fi hotspot in Cleveland this week outside the Republican convention and found that many delegates and others connected to read email, browse the web, and, especially, play Pokemon Go. Avast wanted to make the point that unsecured public Wi-Fi is risky, that and encourage people to sign up for security services like those boys and girls from Prague sell. We're sure, of course, that no one listening to this show would ever use free public Wi-Fi, right? I mean, we wouldn't, would we? Not even for a Charizard? Anyway, the Republican convention was affected this week. Expect the same when the Democrats meet next week. It's a safe bet Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear won't be invited to the podium. Time to tell you about our sponsor, E8 Security. The old perimeter approach to security no longer protects against today's rapidly shifting cyber threats. You've got to address the threats to your network once they're in your networks. E8 Security Behavioral Intelligence Platform enables you to do just that. Its self-learning security analytics give you early warning when your critical resources are being targeted. The E8 Security Platform automatically prioritizes alerts based on risks and lets your security team uncover hidden attack patterns. To detect, hunt, and respond, you need a clear view of the real risks in your business environment. That's what E8 gives you. Visit e8security.com slash DHR and download their free white paper and learn more. E8, transforming security operations. And we thank E8 for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Jonathan Katz. He's the director of the Maryland Cybersecurity Center, also professor of computer science at the University of Maryland. Uh, Jonathan, there, there are lots of good reasons for people to want to, uh, to be anonymous online or protect their identities. Um, there are lots of legitimate reasons. People can be living under oppressive regimes or things like that. And um, a lot of people have relied on uh, Tor uh, to be able to do those sorts of things. But um, there are some problems with Tor that have been discovered recently. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, basically what Tor provides, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with it, uh, it's a system that allows a client to connect to a server in sort of a, uh, an anonymized manner. And the way Tor achieves that is by uh, routing the connection from the client to the server through several intermediate hops in the network. So you might bounce, rather than connecting directly from the client to the server, you would bounce, say, between three or four uh, intermediaries until uh, your connection, until your package would go to the server. And this is meant to make it more difficult for an attacker to then track the source and destination uh, of the communication. Uh, nevertheless, it's been shown uh, that <clears throat> certain information can still be extracted by a dedicated attacker. For example, timing information about when your packets leave your computer and then, uh, and then are received by the server. Even though an attacker can't see all the bounces that that's, being, that that's taking in the network, it can still correlate the uh, outgoing time and the incoming time at the server and from that figure out who's communicating with whom. And so there's a, there's a new system some researchers have come up with that they say improves on this technique. That's right. So actually, it's been known for a long time that there is a sort of an alternate technique that you can use to try to achieve anonymity. Uh, it's called a mixnet. And the basic idea uh, of a mixnet is to take uh, several communications from several clients at once and then randomly permute them and have that occur several times in sequence uh, before those packets uh, from all the different clients are routed to their respective destinations. And this is sort of, uh, th this will prevent the kind of timing attacks I mentioned earlier because you uh, sort of ensure that several clients are all communicating at once and having their messages all delivered at once. Uh, and so it prevents exactly that attack that I talked about earlier. Now, the issue is that uh, in the past, these systems have been relatively inefficient uh, and to the best of my knowledge have not been uh, deployed widely, certainly not as widely as Tor. Um, and this new research uh, proposes a more efficient implementation of these mixnets. So this new system, how exactly does it work? Well, the reason mixnets have historically been kind of slow is that they require the uh, intermediate servers who are doing this mixing to prove correctness uh, of their mixing or their shuffling, as it's sometimes called. And uh, traditionally, that's been done using expensive public key operations. Uh, and what this new system has shown is how to do that using uh, much cheaper symmetric key operations uh, and only relying on uh, a single expensive public key step uh, once per uh, epoch of communication. And when you say expensive or cheap, is that expensive in terms of uh, processor power? Uh, it's actually both in, in terms of computational effort and also uh, communication. All right. Jonathan Katz, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, along with interviews, our glossary, and more, visit thecyberwire.com. Thanks to all of our sponsors who make the CyberWire possible. If you'd like to place your product, service, or solution in front of people who want it, you'll find few better places to do that than the CyberWire. Visit thecyberwire.com slash sponsors and find out how to sponsor our podcast or daily news brief. The CyberWire podcast is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Our social media editor is Jennifer Iben. And our technical editor is Chris Russell. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.